Well, good afternoon. What an honor it is to have you here in this uh, great gathering to honor the Dinkins and uh, to think and reflect on and to appreciate all they've done. Uh, I wasn't here during uh, the good mayor's term, but I'm well aware that I bask in and enjoy the effects of his leadership and administration, and for that I am grateful. So we gather today to do several things. First, to mourn just a bit their passing. We didn't have an opportunity to because of the COVID crisis after their deaths, but now we do. But in, in addition to that, we also gather here to celebrate and to celebrate the legacy, the contributions of two great New Yorkers, David Dinkins and Joyce Dinkins. David is the first black mayor of New York City, and Joyce is the gracious and effective first lady of this city, and to give thanks for their witness and their service. It is also an honor to welcome all who gather here today, including the many luminaries. Uh, I just said that because I, I knew I'd never get the list right. So anyway, every one of you who is a luminary, <laughs> you've, all, you've all made, you've all made your own significant contributions to this city, to the state of New York, and to the United States of America. Thank you. And like the Dinkins, you have left your own mark in the path that our nation now treads. It is a narrow and a dangerous path. I pray for you and your leadership in the days to come that we may be safely guided through these perilous days. And on behalf of all New Yorkers, I thank you for your leadership and your witness. The Cathedral of St. John the Divine is a house of prayer for all people, and all people are welcome here, no matter who you are, where you're from, what you think of yourself or what others think of you. This is God's house. We are made in God's image, each one of us, and therefore this is our house, your house as well. I pray that all who come here in days to come will find inspiration, encouragement, empowerment, and strength to foster their own service to this city and its people. Thank you. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of the righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou anoint me, thy rod and thy staff that comfort me. Thou preparest the table for me in the presence of my enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup overrunneth. Surely godness and mercy shall follow me in all of the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Please look down 
and see my people through. Lord, dear Lord, above God Almighty, God of love, please look down and see my people through. sun and moon up in the sky I don't mind the gray skies because they're just clouds passing by Dear Lord above, God Almighty, God of love, please look down and see my people. Welcome, family, friends, and loved ones. 
We appreciate you coming here to share this special day with us. Our family is so thankful for all expressions of sympathy through emails, cards, texts, and phone calls. Each was appreciated. The memorial tributes and outpouring of love for mom and dad this past year have been overwhelming and have warmed our hearts. Our family was not alone in the tremendous losses that so many have endured during this period. Many other New Yorkers and others throughout this planet lost their loved ones too soon to violence, racial injustice, and the pandemic. We mourn those losses as well. Today we pay tribute to mom and dad individually as well as to their incredible bond of love, marriage, and partnership. We were blessed to have mom and dad through our adult years and their grandchildren were able to spend precious time with them. Mom transitioned peacefully from this earth last October and dad six weeks later. It magnified our loss and heartache. However, it warmed our hearts and brought comfort to know that they are now resting in peace together, watching over us. Mom and dad met at Howard University she joined the Delta Sigma Theta sorority and became the homecoming queen. And despite dad being an Alpha Phi Alpha brother, they dated, fell in love, married, and formed a lifelong partnership. Their love and companionship endured for 67 years. As dad said, time passes, but love endures. And their love and legacy influenced all those whose lives they touched. Mom and dad provided me with unconditional love and support, which have continued to strengthen and sustain me. Mom was one of my best friends and confidants. It is very difficult for me to find the correct words to convey mom's unconditional love and acts of generosity and selflessness throughout her life. She was kind, compassionate, loving, and incredibly patient. Growing up, mom was athletic. She rode horses, was a swimmer, and lifeguard. She took us to ice skate and took us skating. She taught us to ice skate and took us skating Fridays in Central Park. I always remember my friends coming over after school and after parties to sit around the kitchen table with mom. Everyone loved her and wanted to be surrounded by her grace and gentle spirit. Mom was a relentless supporter and campaign organizer for dad. Mom was the quiet strength who organized neighbors to go door to door to carry petitions, volunteer on election days, and perform any other tasks that needed to be done to support dad. Even though she was in the public eye, mom was truly private, fiercely loyal, and protective of our family, friends, and loved ones. Mom took care of her parents, took care of dad, then David and myself, and Jamal and Kalila. She worried about others before herself and sacrificed by putting the needs of family first. From my earliest days on this earth, mom cared for me, nurtured me, and taught me everything I know about compassion and mothering. When I think of my mom, the words from Maya Angelou's poem, Mother, a cradle to hold me, describe the special love and bond. It is true, I was created in you. It is also true that you were created for me. I owned your voice. It was shaped and tuned to soothe me. Your arms were molded into a cradle to hold me, to rock me. The scent of your body was the air perfumed for me to breathe. You were always the heart of happiness to me. I loved mom with all my heart and am blessed for every day that I was able to be with her. I have grieved the loss of our close friendship and all the things that we used to share on a daily basis. But those memories and her strength persevered in even the most difficult days. Mom was always there for me no matter what with the kind of unconditional love that has sustained me and strengthened me. I miss mom every minute of every day but I am so thankful to have had her physically with me for all these years and to have been there with her as she peacefully left this earth. I know her love and spirit forever live in my heart. 
After mom died, dad peacefully transitioned from this earth six weeks later. My heart was so heavy and sad with grief to lose dad so soon after mom and more suddenly than we expected. Dad was a hero to me and to so many. We shared dad with this city and with the world. But most of all, he was our dad, granddad, brother, and uncle. He was incredibly proud of his grandchildren and talked about them at every opportunity. This past year, I heard many beautiful and meaningful tributes about dad. He was that same champion for us. From my earliest days, dad instilled in us to be independent, to strive for excellence in everything we did, and to treat everyone with respect and kindness. Dad thought it was important to be comfortable in all situations and environments. I remember him telling us it was important to be able to hang out in the streets and to know which fork to use at a formal dinner. As a child, our family would go to Belmar on the Jersey Shore with our grandparents during the summer. Dad and I would get up early so the two of us would be some of the first people on the beach and then spend all day there. Dad taught me to be fearless and swim out past the waves in order to swim parallel to the shore. Mom would later sit on the beach, worried as she saw my white bathing cap bobbing up and down out in the ocean. Although Dad did not always agree with my choices, he always supported me in all my endeavors. When I spent time in Liberia, West Africa as a Peace Corps volunteer, he reassured Mom that I would be fine, even though he worried as well especially when I was there during the country's first coup. When I pursued degrees in nursing and clinical social work, he always ex expressed his pride in me. My career choice was not politics, but dad's commitment to social justice shaped my personal and professional life. My favorite memory of dad's time as mayor was when Nelson Mandela visited New York City and stayed with our parents. Dad hosted him on his first trip to the United States after his release from his unjust incarceration as a political prisoner. Nelson Mandela once said, what counts in life is not the mere fact that we have lived. It is what difference we have made to the lives of others that will determine the significance of the life we lead. The tremendous impact of my parents' lives on so many throughout this city and beyond was demonstrated by the outpouring of love for them in this past year. For the time they walked on this planet, their lives and their work exemplified compassion, humanity, and commitment to serve others. After they transitioned from this earth, the pain was initially sharp. Now that it has been a year, it is more of a dull ache, and the memories bring a smile, warmth, and comfort. I continue to be comforted by knowing that they are together at peace. I was blessed with having their unconditional love and support throughout my life. Mom and Dad's love, spirit, and strength have sustained me, given me strength, and remain in my heart always. I hope to honor their legacy in my personal and professional life by remaining commitment, committed to social and racial justice and equity, advocating for those who cannot advocate for themselves, and working with children and families who experience trauma in their own lives. Mom and Dad touched many lives, were loved, and were important to so many. We are grateful for every tribute that will be voiced here today. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Diane Pollard. Thank you, Donna and David, for inviting me to share a few words about their mom at this time. Today, we gather to celebrate the life of Joyce Burroughs Dinkins, bride of David N. Dinkins, mother of Donna and David Jr., lover of all children, 
grandmother of Kalila and Jamal, a great New Yorker, and my very dear friend. I first met Joyce about 45 years ago in my Harlem neighborhood where we both lived. I was a volunteer at the Carver Democratic Club. Her dad, Danny Burroughs, owned a local business in the neighborhood and was very active in Harlem, democratic politics, of course. He became a friend and mentor to me as well and I received a wonderful orientation into politics, particularly in the, in the continuing struggle of the civil rights and the important realization of being a part of something larger than myself. When I reflect on Joyce's life and gifts, I am reminded over and over of the amazing contributions she made to this city and the tremendous impact she had on so many of our children and young adults and on their lives. Joyce's mission focused on spearheading opportunities for reading in many of our public schools and on other neighborhood programs, and we talk frequently about the need to continue to be involved in making these opportunities available. Her love of her alma mater and the mission of Howard University exemplified her continued focus in the educational leadership and training of future African American leaders as well. Joyce and I talked often about the love and pride she had for her children and, gran and grandchildren, and she was so very proud of you all. Joyce and I were friends when she was a simple New Yorker, and I say that in the finest way. It continued when she became the first African-American first lady of the city of New York. When David was elected mayor in 1990, life changed radically for my friend Joyce. She became the occupant of a very transparent fishbowl. This change in circumstances did not change her. And this is what I remember and treasure most about Joyce. It did not change her. She retained her passion for the underserved, her love of all children, and her burning desire to contribute to the education and early childhood development of the young. We talked about this often. She championed the educational growth and opportunities that children received simply by being provided a hot breakfast and a volunteer to help them learn to read. Joyce started reading groups at local schools and libraries and supported them by reading to the children on site and in person herself quite often. She succeeded in sharing her hopes widely and in energizing and encouraging others to join her in this work. While COVID-19 has very sadly prevented us from celebrating the lives of those we have lost this past year, I am reminded that the measure of a life can never be forgotten or discounted simply because circumstances at the time of their death prevent us from a celebration. Today, we are privileged to celebrate the life of Joyce Burroughs Dinkins, an amazing woman and a pioneer, a devoted wife, mother, grandmother, and friend. Well done, my friend. May she rest in peace and rise in glory. Amen. I first met Joyce Jenkins in 1990. 
newly appointed by Mayor Dinkins as one of his two appointees to the New York City Board of Education, I had proposed a first day back to school campaign and asked her to be the spokesperson. Little did I know that over the next 30 years, we would become such close friends, and then something happened along the way she became my New York mother. Off we would venture to Bloomingdale's or Saks Fifth Avenue to go shopping and have lunch. Then there was the movie or theater, doctors and hair appointments, black tie events, Christmas family dinners, birthday celebrations, and of course, the US Open. I had such a great sense of reassurance when she insisted that I call her as soon as I got home so she would know that I was safe. <clears throat> because you know that's what mothers do. Why, 23 years ago, she even insisted that she and the mayor, he will always be my mayor, would host the dinner in their apartment the night before my wedding. And tomorrow, October 24th, 23 years ago, the mayor gave me away. In fact, I have a folder with every card and every note that she sent to me over the years, signing it, Love Joyce, or Love Joyce and David, and notes handwritten by his honor, starting with Dear Daughter, and signing it, Daddy David. Yes, indeed, they were my New York parents. To the public, Mrs. D, as I always called her, may have seemed quiet or reserved, but I quickly learned that she was an astute politician explaining with amazing ac accuracy exactly what was really going on behind the scenes at the local, state, or federal level. She was the consummate hostess who could put Emily Post to shame. And Mrs. D, could tell me exactly what she was really thinking under her breath and between her teeth while wearing a pleasantly sweet smile on her public face. She even taught me how to look at my watch in a public setting so that no one will know that I was checking the time. I remember not long after I had celebrated my one-year wedding anniversary that my beloved and I had our first big disagreement. For those of you who have been or are married, you know what I'm talking about. There I stood in their kitchen at 215 East 68th Street in apartment 31D as she handed me a freshly brewed, brewed cup of coffee. Mm-hmm, she said. You were in such a big hurry to get married, now you're going to find out what it means to be married. <laughs> and she would know, after 67 years of marriage, still lovingly called his bride to the day she took her last breath. A devoted wife who dearly loved her children and doted on her grandchildren, her first and last priority was family including her extended family, some of who are gathered here today. Thank you, Donna and David, for so generously sharing your parents with me. And a deep, heartfelt thank you for taking such good care of your parents in their twilight years. My friends, I will always, always remember Mrs. D, and I do so miss her. Heaven is a little more crowded this day, but I know that she is smiling down from above, showering us with her love. God rest her. And now I will close because I have looked at my watch without you even noticing, and I know that my time is up. Thank you. On this chilly autumn day, I greet you with the peace of God and glory of Jesus Christ. Thank you, Dean Clifton Daniel, for your gracious welcome. And thank you, Donna and David, 
for your invitation to join this esteemed and loving circle of speakers. When I was summoned to the Dinkins home to pray with Joyce during her final hours and was asked to give the eulogy at the family service and invited to speak today, I realized it was a testimony to the enduring bond that I held with Joyce, David, and the family. And I realized after the death of Joyce and David, how true the words of writer Joan Didion. I quote her, grief, when it comes, is nothing like we expect it to be. I met David and Joyce Dinkins nearly 40 years ago. Surveying those years, I have splendid recollections of the entire family at various religious services, civic events, fundraisers, and on countless times when David was mayor and Joyce was the first lady of the city. There were also those private conversations that Joyce and I shared, several at the Riverside Church, others over the telephone, and extra special were those barely audible discussions under the hairdryer at the beauty salon. Some of those conversations were about this day. Joyce shared her desire to have her final resting place be here in this awe-inspiring cathedral. And today we come from the east and west and north and south but we're all gathered as family, friends, colleagues, and neighbors to Joyce Burroughs Dinkins. With uncommon insight and tenderness of heart, Joyce was keenly aware that to live each day fully was an act of faith. She loved the sacredness and reverence of high church and of her own personal prayer and worship. Joyce walked with a quiet confidence that was anchored by her early religious education. She understood the scripture in Jeremiah chapter 31 that reads, I will place my law within them and write it upon their hearts. This word was not lost upon Joyce. She knew that taking the time to listen within for the wisdom of God pointed the way to powerful personal and social transformation. Her faith was tangible, and it shone as a beacon for all who knew her. And it was because of her faith that Joyce was able to live the remarkable life that she did, rooted in grace, courage, compassion, and love. In her life, she showed us how to walk softly with God. Our memories are personal and unique, and they offer us help in dealing with our grief. Yet there are some things about Joyce that we all know. We know of her unwavering support of civil rights causes, children's reading programs, civic organizations, and community programs throughout the greater Harlem community, and that was inspiring. Joyce was disturbed by the unraveling of the economy and the unraveling of access to decent education for children living in Harlem and other urban areas. By her passion and commitment, Joyce chose generosity over greed and compassion over indifference. Her life as a devoted wife, mother, grandmother, mother-in-law, and sister-in-law, a professional woman, mentor, and friend, though buffeted by great challenges, her love, commitment, and devotion stood the test of time and stress. We know that Joyce was married for 67 years, that she had two beloved children and two cherished grandchildren. 
We know that she devoted four years of her life to serve as the First Lady of New York City. But beyond those numbers is something immeasurable. How do you measure the compassion and humanity of a woman who connected with people at every level, and particularly with children? Joyce's life was a grand tapestry woven by God. We bear witness to the monumental ways God walked with and worked through Joyce over her lifetime. We bear witness to the presence of God on the wings of mourning and even especially in the depths of suffering during the final years of her life. Even as the dark clouds threaten to overtake you, God reminds us in Psalm chapter 139, even in the darkness, is not darkness to you, O God, for the night is as bright as the day, and the darkness is as light to you. How unmistakable is that comforting truth. David and Donna, both of you know the unfailing and unflagging love your mother showered upon you. You inherit a bright and noble heritage, and the special bond you shared with your mom is eternal and unbreakable. And to you, Jamal and Kalila, that unique relationship and love that flowed between you and your Nana will live on within you forever. And you will pass that love on to future generations. Kalila and Francois, may your baby bring untold joy to your grieving hearts and to the hearts of your parents and your immediate and extended family. I am convinced that Joyce and David are somewhere close, smiling and holding you in love and in prayer. To all of you, family, extended family, and dear friends, present here today, and those who are not here, please know we will continue to surround you in prayer. Most of all, know you're not alone. Together, we mourn the loss of one dear to our hearts, yet intermingled with the sadness and grief we feel the presence of God's love and healing hand holding us all together. By her life and death, Joyce Burroughs Dinkins showed us the way to renewal and growth in this life. When we attune to the awesome ways of God's presence, accompanied Joyce throughout her life, we cannot help but be mindful, too, of that same presence at work in our lives. Part of waking up to the presence of God is acknowledging that God can be encountered and embraced anywhere and everywhere. The psalmist cries out, where can I go from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and settle at the farthest limits of the sea, even there, your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me fast. With quiet confidence, Joyce was attuned to the presence of God. She lived her life for the now and the forever. Joyce made plans for this day because she knew what is seen is transient and what is unseen is eternal. She was aware of the presence and movement of God in all things. She envisioned it, she embraced it, and she gifted it to us. Thanks be to God.
not sing like an April breeze on the wings of spring and you appear in all your splendor my one and only Spread their mystic charm in the hush of night while I'm in your arms. I feel your lips so warm and tender, my one and only love. The touch of your hand feels like heaven. Heaven that I've never known. The blush on your cheek whenever I speak. Tells me that you are my own. You fill my eager heart with such desire. Every kiss you give sets my soul on fire. I give myself in sweet surrender My one and only love of your hand feels like heaven a heaven that I've never known the blush on your cheek whenever I speak Tells me that you are my own. You fill my eager heart with such desire. Every kiss you give sets my soul on fire. I give myself in sweet surrender My one and only love My
I want it only Donna and David and all the members of the Dinkins family, if you spent any time around the mayor, you got to hear about you guys. You got to hear about his love. You got to hear about how family was the center of his life, the pride he felt. And you may not have known how much you were the source of his energy and his strength and what brought him joy. But we all got to see it. I want to thank all the members of the Dinkins family's family because we, all of us who experienced the greatness of David Dinkins, all the people in this city who benefited from him, none of that would have been possible without you. So please, everyone, join me in applauding the members of this great family. I'm going to talk about Mayor Dinkins, but I have to say something for a moment about Joyce Dinkins, because Everything we experienced wouldn't have been possible without her in every way. And I want to just take a moment to connect with my brothers and sisters who were part of that extraordinary experience in 1989. If you had anything to do with the 1989 David Dinkins campaign, raise your hand right now. Well, then everyone I see here was part of the ultimate ragtag army. Come on, were we ragtag or what? We were unlikely, we were not always the best regarded, but we had spirit and we had heart. And when we needed to look for some strength, we had a wonderful maternal figure among us in Joyce Dinkins. Because if you saw her in action, yes, charming and a smile for everyone and always knew the right thing to say, but you could see the steel. You could see the strength. It doesn't surprise me when we heard that beyond that perfect smile, she sometimes had a comment or two about the proceedings she saw around her. We could all sense that she didn't suffer fools easily, that she saw the truth of the world and she wanted to do something about it, and she found many a way. But we know that everything great that Mayor David Dinkins achieved, he achieved with her. Now, I'm going to indulge in some Dinkinsisms, some nostalgia for all of you out there. And first, I'm going to say when you're speaking to such a distinguished crowd, one ought not acknowledge everyone in the room. Now, I remember many a time when David Dinkins said you should not acknowledge everyone in the room and then proceeded to acknowledge everyone, which I found contradictory. So I will not follow that path, but for a very few for a good reason. First of all, there's only a few of us left, so I want to thank my predecessor, Mayor Michael Bloomberg, for joining us. There's Michael Bloomberg, there's me, and there's another guy whose name I can't remember. <laughs> Tomato. 
Or we could put it this way, there are two sane remaining living mayors of New York City. Somehow I think David Dinkins would have allowed me that break of protocol. The other acknowledgement of a dignitary is of someone, and I saw this so many times and it moved me so much, someone David Dinkins called his brother, who he took inspiration from, who he took spirit from, who always knew the right move and the right path, because as he would say himself, he was educated in a very, very special institution, UCLA, the University of the Corner of Lenox Avenue. <laughs> Congressman Charlie Rangel, thank you. And the ultimate acknowledgement is very personal. For Shirlane and Chiara and Dante and I, we know, you know, in politics, the famous phrase, what have you done for me lately? I always say, we know what David Dinkins did for us because I had the joy of meeting Shirlane and we fell in love while working for Mayor Dinkins. And for Chiara and Dante, well, Mayor Dinkins is the reason they are on this earth. So I thank you, Dave, I thank you because you made all things possible for our family. I want to just say this. I, I am not here to list his many accomplishments, and they are many, and so often overlooked by the conventional voices. I often have said, David Dinkins shaped this city in so many ways, and yet so many people tried to airbrush his contribution out of history. But we remember, and we feel it. And everybody who experienced what he did feels it. But I want to talk about how we feel. The famous phrase from Maya Angelou, it's not what you said, it's how you made them feel. David Dinkins made us feel a lot. I witnessed the way he encountered the world around him and the way he made people believe things that they wouldn't have otherwise. When he called us all together in 1989, I hope a lot of you remember, he took that idea of the Rainbow Coalition. Some of us were with Jesse Jackson Sr. last night. He took that Rainbow Coalition, he made it come alive here in New York City. We would enter a room at campaign headquarters and we would see every kind of New Yorker working in harmony in a way that for most of us, we had never experienced before in our lives. He made us feel that we were building something new. And he embodied it. He animated it. Now, since I will provide you with a moment or two of nostalgia for everyone who went to the 1989 campaign headquarters, you'll remember there were some other uh, business organizations in that building. Reverend, let's just say it was Times Square, 1989. Some of the businesses in that building were not spreading the gospel. <laughs> Their interests were more temporal. And uh, it, we had some interesting encounters in the elevator on the way to the campaign headquarters. But when you got there, you saw the future. You saw a unity that still didn't exist but could exist because of David Dinkins. When you're out in communities, you saw the love people felt. And the way he brought that forward, he didn't hold it at arm's length. He let that love come out. He connected with people on the most human level. But we all know he connected most deeply, and it was a beauty to behold, he connected most deeply with the children of our city. If you spent more than five minutes with him and a child was nearby, you were going to hear phrases like cupcake and pumpkin and buddy. But I remember, and it happened many a time, but it moved me every single time. I remember when you get close up and look a group of children in the eye, and if they were children of color, he always made sure to include in everything he said to them about their bright futures, you know you can become mayor. Because he understood he was a living example. He understood he was saying in that moment and showing that the old rules were gone. And that moved me every time. 
And you could see the light in the eyes of those kids when they heard it. You could see the pride their parents felt in their possibilities because David Dinkins was saying it was possible. I remember the difficult times, the indignities that were directed at him that no mayor, no person should have experienced. I remember that horrible day in Bensonhurst when those who disagreed with him held up watermelons. I remember when off-duty police officers rioted in City Hall Plaza. I remember the difficult times. And those should not be airbrushed out of history either. But I saw his strength. A lesser man could have buckled. He had a powerful sense of resiliency that in the act of not giving in was progress itself. He showed us, and a lot of us were young, and a lot of us didn't know what was possible, but he showed us a strength and a way of living. He had a steel, too, like Joyce. And he also knew how to put people in their place when they needed to be reminded of just who he was. I remember one time early in the first year of the mayorality, a group of Officials was briefing him, and they had stayed over from the previous administration. At a certain point, they started to talk to him in a manner that was maybe just a bit condescending. He cut off the conversation sharply, and he turned to those of us who had been a part of his campaign, and he said, you know, some people think we got here by taking a civil service exam. And then he let a uh, hush fall over the room to make his point. I remember so many of those moments. I remember moments of triumph. I remember moments where he dared. When he brought Nelson Mandela here, it wasn't easy, it wasn't without controversy, but it was audacious because he said, and he knew, he was providing Nelson Mandela with the state visit he deserved, but the United States of America was not yet ready to give him. David Dinkins did that here in New York City. If you were at the steps of City Hall that day or if you were at Yankee Stadium, it's like it was yesterday. And we could feel the power of what our mayor was doing when he had President Aristide here among us in solidarity. The many acts that he took that were brave, whether they were local or international, he was willing to go places that weren't convenient and do things that weren't always the conventional wisdom. Because behind that kindness, that courtesy, that warmth was a man who demanded change and personified it. And I'll finish with this because I have so many feelings when I think of David Dinkins and so many New Yorkers do to this hour of this day. We felt his dignity, we felt his heart, the kindness he showed to people, the loyalty, the way he always upheld and uplifted the young people in his team, the way he told us what was possible for us, and we heard it and we believed. But I ultimately remember one thing, and this is the most important feeling of all. For so many people, who had felt held back, who had seen change denied time and time again, who didn't know if it was even possible to hope for a better and fairer life, David Dinkins, every moment he stepped in front of a microphone, every moment he walked a street of this city, every time he put his hand out to a child, every time he gave us hope that yes, in fact, things could change. Many, many contributions, but to me, the greatest was he proved it. For anyone who needed hope, for anyone who needed to believe that it was worth the struggle, worth the fight, 
worth pouring out our heart and our soul and our love for something better, he proved that, yes, it was worth it. He gave us hope, and that hope will never die. God bless you all. Thank you, David, Donna, Kalila, Jamal, for sharing your parents and grandparents with our city, nation, and world. I'm so honored to be with you today to talk about my mentor, colleague, friend, and hero, our beloved Professor David Dinkins. Yes, I said professor. Everyone here today remembers David Dinkins as the extraordinary 106th mayor of the city of New York. But after serving the people of New York City, or as he liked to say, after getting evicted from public housing, Mayor Dinkins chose to lead, inspire, and teach from the front of a Columbia University classroom. There are over a thousand young people that he taught over his 25 years at Columbia University and they know him as professor. And this wasn't the most obvious career choice for an elected official of his stature. Mayor Dinkins could have chosen to trade his vast knowledge and extensive experience in government for a lucrative law career, but it shouldn't surprise anyone who knew him that really wasn't going to happen. In retrospect, teaching college students was an obvious choice for Mayor Dinkins. Peter Johnson Jr. thought that the mayor should be at Columbia and he had a plan and we all followed his lead. And as it turns out, Columbia was actually thrilled to have Mayor Dinkins on faculty and he's been an important part of our community since 1994. At Columbia, Mayor Dinkins was able to extend his commitment to public service. He taught two core courses in New York City and urban policy, and these courses offered students an insider's view of how urban policy gets made. New York City's most important civic leaders competed, and I say competed, to make guest appearances in his class. This was a hot ticket, and if you couldn't pass the standards of Carol Banks and later Linda Hamilton, you never had a chance, and you didn't make it to David Dinkin's office or his classroom. Whether they were senior government officials, community organizers, journalists, civic union or business leaders, Mayor Dinkins had them all there for a specific reason. I was able to join those classes for his lecture on, believe it or not, fiscal policy. And I was there every year with Dal Forsyth and Dick Ravitch. Yes, Dick Ravitch, that was the guy he beat in the mayoral primary, and they were good friends. And Dal Forsyth, that was always my favorite introduction that he provided because his punchline was, and would you believe it? He's the son of the actor John Forsythe, and not one kid in the room knew who John Forsythe was. <laughs> but every year he said it. And then my favorite one was Roger Ailes. Yes, I said Roger Ailes. Bob Herbert from the New York Times, and of course, Eleanor Tatum from the Amsterdam News, all together on the same panel in that classroom. Mayor Dinkins had a plan for his students. They were meant to see firsthand the opportunities for them to go into public service and to do something really valuable for society. Not only did he teach our students what it means to be a public servant, he continued to use his position and authority to improve people's lives, as you heard from everyone today, and to help those he considered most in need. And we at Columbia all benefited from the mayor's generous spirit and his lifelong commitment to mentoring children and young adults. And I was fortunate to have the office across from Mayor Dinkins to work with him on his courses 
And each year on the David N. Dinkins Leadership in Public Policy Forum, and together we were able to choose the first David N. Dinkins professor, Mayor Michael Nutter. And I was able to feel the warmth of his soul and the generosity of his spirit and to benefit from his wisdom. In fact, when I had the opportunity to enter the administration of Mayor B Michael Bloomberg, I hesitated for a moment and I went in to see Mayor Dinkins. And he said to me, you've got to go, you've got to be a part of this, it's important for you to do this. Now, Mayor Bloomberg, I'm not sure whether you are happy that Mayor Dinkins gave me that advice, but uh, of course that's for another time. And um, later on, we do know that Mayor Dinkins did endorse you for the President of the United States. Extraordinary, it's just an extraordinary way he was able to understand who are the right people for the right time. And he always made his students and young people who came in to seek his advice special. It also seemed that, like every dignitary and celebrity, had come to him and had been in his office. But he never stopped being someone, even that elected officials in the city, up to his very last months, came to to see for an endorsement or for some special words of encouragement. And you all remember his extraordinary pictures in his office. You could chart the last 75 years of history in those pictures. Yet it was the pictures of Joyce and Davy and Donna and his grandchildren that had the pride of place on his desk. And it was their accomplishments that he spoke about to everyone who'd listen and to some who weren't listening that made him most proud. And I too am a professor, and so I must say one important thing about David Dinkins, the mayor. I know we are all heartened that his policy legacy is finally being recognized and appreciated. And those of you who worked with him in state government as borough president and then as mayor know what Mayor Dinkins accomplished. He inherited a city that was racially divided on the verge of another fiscal crisis, crime rising, libraries closed, and a city that businesses were leaving. And he reversed every one of those trends. He healed our racial divides, balanced the budget, reduced crime through safe streets, safe cities, invested in our youth, reopened the libraries, and completed the two most important economic development deals in New York City's history, Disney in Times Square and the US Open in Flushing Meadow Park. The facts have a way of stubbornly reasserting themselves. He was patient, and I am glad he saw the facts restored to his story. And I think all of us here today and every student touched by Mayor Dinkins knows that his legacy goes beyond his policy achievements. His political philosophy and governing style came from something deeply embedded in his soul. Yes, David Dinkins was a decent man, a good person, but he was also a fighter, as everyone said, for social justice, racial equality, and he fought to make the promise of the American dream available to everyone. David Dinkins and his politics and his life worked to build coalitions. This is something extraordinary in today's world. We can see that it's much easier to divide people than it is to bring people together. The gorgeous mosaic was not just a metaphor for Mayor Dinkins. He lived a life understanding that people in fact have differences, but there is beauty in all of us and those differences need to be respected. And ultimately for our democracy to work, we cannot live separately as individuals. We must figure out how we all fit together in that gorgeous mosaic. And I just have to acknowledge that there are several students who came from long distances to be here today to remember our Mayor Dinkins. Corinne Jean-Pierre, who's currently 
uh, works for President Biden as his deputy uh, press secretary, came from Washington, D.C. Vikash Reddy, his longest serving graduate student, flew in from California to be here today, and he's wearing the bow tie, and I knew he would, that Mayor Dinkins gave him when he completed his PhD. One of my students, Nina Robbins, wrote, Mayor Dinkins gave me faith in politicians. He was always decent, optimistic, and warm. He always said hello to all the nobodies, including me on the 14th floor. I'm so sorry for your loss, and I wish you strength and vivid memories of your best times together. David and Donna, thank you for sharing your dad with a grateful city. As we gather in this holy place to remember this amazing man and his equally extraordinary wife, Joyce, I can't help but think that Mayor Dinkins is smiling and that his eyes are twinkling with humility and delight and that he continues to watch over us all. Professor David Dinkins, you can rest in peace. We will never forget you, and we will continue your work. Good afternoon. My name is Katrina Adams, and it is an honor to be here today to say a few words about my dear friend, mentor, tennis buddy, and second father, the Honorable Mayor David Dinkins. Thank you to David and Donna and the entire family for embracing me and sharing your father with me and countless others. Now, one of the mayor's famous statements was, everything has been said, but not everyone has said it. So I will try to say something a little bit different. I got to know David most when I joined the board of directors of the USTA. When I walked into my first meeting and this gentle soul, warm smile and commanding voice welcomed me to the board. I was mesmerized by someone of his stature being in the room. The former mayor of New York City sat on this board, one of three black people at the time, including myself. I knew I couldn't be in a better place. David quickly took me under his wing and mentored me into what he believed would be a good board member, or that I would be a good board member. It's a problem when you have digital, right? He encouraged me to be prepared and by all means speak up. He told me that there was no better place or person to be at the table than me with my 12 year experience as a former player on the WTA tour and having grown up in the inner city of Chicago and that I had so much to offer to the board and to the USTA in giving back to grassroots tennis. You see, David admired me in my professional tennis career from afar as I admired what he had done and being the first black mayor of New York City. But I never thought that our paths would actually ever cross. He was gentle, generous, funny, stern, thoughtful, brilliant, but most importantly, he was welcoming and embraced all. I adopted him as my second father as I was new to New York and he reminded me of my father in many ways back in Chicago. The mayor was always first to acknowledge his love for children, and he did that everywhere he went, representing tennis. He made sure that he supported youth. He acknowledged them almost as much as he did his lovely bride, Joyce, which was always, and daddy's little angel, Donna, and daddy's little fella, David Jr. It was a long time before I actually knew that his kids were actually older than me. He never said no if I asked him to support an event or our program or myself in any way. He was just always there. Tennis was his passion. He used a sport to live a healthy lifestyle and to introduce anyone who played to each other. He supported programs like mine, the Harlem Junior Tennis and Education Program and the New York Junior Tennis League 
in hopes that these youth use tennis to be champions in life. Education was a key and tennis was the hook. He absolutely loved talking to and playing with the kids whenever he could. He would always ask a young person that if he or she was playing an old man like himself, would they hit a drop shot and then lob them just to win the point? He would always thump the child because they didn't know what to answer in order not to hurt his feelings because of course a child wants to win the point, right? But he wanted to find out just how determined they were to be competitive or to be considerate. When I moved to New York, he immediately invited me to join his doubles group on Saturday or Sundays at Roosevelt Island Tennis Club to play, talk, laugh, and meet like-minded people. He was the ultimate connector. I miss those weekend matches. I miss those moments of just catching up and solving problems. I miss his laugh. I miss his stories, and I miss him being a fixture at the U.S. Open. I miss him telling me how he was proud of me, particularly when I was named the first African-American president, chairman, and CEO of the USTA. He knew something about being the first. As we traveled to meetings across the country together, I noticed how he acknowledged everyone that he passed, addressing them as buddy. I often asked him, did he know this person or that person? And he said, no, but everyone likes to be acknowledged no matter who they are or what they do, especially when you're a public figure. I learned a valuable lesson from him that day and I too acknowledge everyone, but I call them boo. <laughs> David befriended any and everyone who played the sport. He admired the discipline that one had to go out and just swing the racket. He was revered around the tennis world, attending as a dignitary at Wimbledon, the French Open, the Bermuda Celebrity Tennis Classic, and many other special places. He truly was an icon in our sport. Now please allow me to also speak on behalf of the USTA just for a moment in thanking David for his countless contributions to tennis and to the US Open. He was a great friend to both. His passion for our sport, fueled by his belief that tennis could be a powerful tool in inspiring young people to reach higher, dream bigger, and accomplish their goals. We were especially fortunate to have David lend that passion to the USDA Board of Directors for 12 years, where his unique ability to listen, learn, and bring people together truly helped to shape the association and enhance its growth. David also helped to shape the US Open into a global success that it is today, playing a key role in relocating the tournament from Forest Hills to Flushing Meadows. And while mayor, he helped the USCA secure a 99-year lease for the National Tennis Center, ensuring that the US Open would long have a home here in New York City. In 2008, the area outside of the National Tennis Center's East Gate, the welcome mat for those who annually come to New York to experience David's favorite event, was renamed in his honor and is now known as the David Dinkins Circle. In closing, David did love tennis, and tennis most certainly loved him back. All of us at the USCA and in the tennis community were most fortunate to have been a part of this incredible love affair. Thank you. Donna, David's precious little angel, the mother of his grandchildren, thank you so much for including me at this memorable occasion. 
and daddy's little boy, David. You will always be his little boy, even though you've shed it. Television and boxing and sports in a first class way. When I first walked into uh, this church, I felt very comfortable. But this is an awesome occasion. And uh, America's largest cathedral with some of the most important and powerful political and intellectual people throughout that are here. In this room, uh, mayors, ambassadors, scholars, achievers, No research could prepare me to tell you how grateful or moved I am by my getting to spend so much of my life with my brother, Dave Dinkins. When I think of all of the people here that have had contacts with David. I know as we speak this afternoon that all of you have your own stories. When you met David, what happened with David? And you have such wonderful reminders how fortunate you are to have gotten to meet and love him as I have. And the same applies to his beautiful bride, Joyce. When I hear the stories so different from the ones that I lived with David. And so I hope that while everything has been said about David Dinkins, not everybody has had a chance to say it. So please leave here this afternoon thanking his family for allowing you to meet each other and to share the wonderful life, love, and experiences of David Dinkins. Mayor de Blasio had said that I sometimes have referred to my education on the University of the Corner of Lenox Avenue. And the truth of the matter is that Dave Dinkins brought a light, lot to my life and my wife Alma's life because I knew more about Lenox Avenue than I ever would know about New York University or St. John's Law School. There's so much to be learned from historic black colleges. So much to be learned in the campuses. So much to be exchanged, so many ideas, so many things that you never had a chance to dream about. And no matter how fortunate I was to survive the Korean War, 
to be grateful to the GI Bill, to join the U.S. Attorney's Office and become an Assemblyman and become a member of Congress. There was always something that somehow I thought I had missed. And then, before this service began, I was talking to Andrew Young, who all of you know what sanity is still left to uh, this country, put his life on the line to march for freedom and to work with Dr. Martin Luther King. And we need him so much now as we near the second civil war in this nation. But sitting in the back, I just assumed that he was just another one of those Howard buddies of David. And he was going to talk to me about tennis and all of the wonderful things that they did in Howard. <laughs> but instead, he told me that David kind of adop adopted him, that he wasn't the best student in the world, and that he did not know what these guys who were wearing the blazers with their gold buttons and the khaki pants were all about. And David recognized as a math major that this guy needed a little help. <laughs> and all the time, I was listening to Ambassador Young. I was thinking that when I first met my wife, who went to a historic black college, when I had first, before I'd go into law school, and she told me that she was AKA. I said, so was I. <laughs> I had no idea what she was talking about. <laughs> and for you people that don't know what I'm talking about, <laughs> thank you for coming to be with this group. When the late and the great Adam Clayton Powell saw fit not to spend too much time in the village of Harlem, there was a lot of people running around wondering what to do. And then a friend of Joyce Burrow Dinkins' father, Danny Burroughs, her father, had a very powerful black friend who was the first black county leader in the state of New York. His name was J. Raymond Jones. You may have seen his picture fleeting with his silver white hair and is referred to as the silver fox. And Percy Sutton and I were, he was a giant, and I still had my training of Lenox Avenue. Basil Patterson was a giant, but he was with Percy, and we never had an agenda. But J. Raymond Jones brought us all together, and we met Danny Burroughs' son-in-law. Joyce's dad. And he had been a famous political chess player. And he brought us all together some kind of way. And each of us made our contribution to the so-called Gang of Four that God now, unfortunately, is calling our class. And I think what 
I never would have dreamed that I would have gone to the Congress that Percy Sutton would become borough president, that Patterson would become a national leader, or that David Dinkins, with all of his modesty and articulation, would become the first African-American mayor of the greatest city in the entire world. I marveled at his ability to have so much trust and confidence in so many different people because of his background and his training, his compassion and his love and his belief that this mosaic could actually work, not only for him, not only for our city, but for our country. And today, as you all know, is being tested. But as I talked with Ambassador Young, one of the things that he brought to the so-called Gang of Four was not only his political skills and intellect, but he brought class. He brought class that we were not accustomed to on Lenox Avenue. <laughs> and I found myself wearing bow ties. <laughs> I found myself wearing colored handkerchiefs in my pocket. <laughs> I started finding out what cufflinks was all about. I learned more about Alpha Phi Alpha and the Boule that I never knew. I became closer to my wife in understanding that you have to mention why you are existing each and every day, wherever you are. And when someone said he was the godfather and I saw I couldn't walk down the street, that somehow he had pictures before the iPhones of every child in his pocket, and I couldn't get to one block without him stopping and hugging and giving hope, especially those of the color, that because he stood on so many people's shoulders, like Percy Sutton, like Jesse Jackson, that he become their mayor. At occasions like this, Dave always closed in saying that he had read someplace that God had considered good deeds as the price that we should be paying as rent for our existence on this earth. Good deeds are uh, saying that each one of us must continue to care for each other, to have compassion for each other, and to give hope for the future that we can pull this country with all of its warts together. David certainly has paid the rent in full in making this a better community, a better city. With Nelson Mandela, he helped to make it a better world. All of us wonder what can we can do to thank the Dinkins family and the wonderful legacy that David had left us by allowing us to know him during this brief period that we have on this planet. And he will close as I will close in saying, as far as good deeds and rent is concerned, don't let God find you in arrears. Thank you all so much.
we have a slight change in the program, ladies and gentlemen, a slight adjustment. We will have Clayton Bryant, Valerie Gant, and Burgundy Williams on background vocals. And our special guest, a true giant and genius of modern music, Ms. Valerie Simpson. Thank you, Jay. I'm so glad that I'm here. When Jay called, I immediately said yes. Because David Dinkins and his lovely wife meant so much to Nick and I. We watched them. We studied them because just like the song we wrote said, ain't nothing like the real thing. And that's what they had. You know, since they made this transition, that means the family is in need. So I thought about this song that Richard Smallwood wrote. We all need angels now. You know, these are perilous times. So we need somebody looking down on us, giving us protection, guiding us through this journey down here. We need angels. Nothing but 
watching to know. No matter where you go, you can have a personal angel. So glad. So glad. I'm so glad about it. Donna, I know you. know you got one. know you got two. Watching over me, watching, 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 looking out for me, yeah, yeah. Watching, watching over me, watching over me, watching over me, watching over me. In 1989, the year before Mayor Dinkins was inaugurated, I was installed as the senior pastor at the Riverside Church just a few blocks away. Now, what I noticed was that almost every major dignitary who had a funeral, seems like they came through Riverside. And Mayor Dinkins, whether they were great or small, would show up. Even if he did have to leave, he'd make his normal comment, comments about the John Towns flood, as well as leaving in arrears, as uh, uh, Congressman Rangel spoke about. But what I learned <clears throat> at a church where Dinkins heard me give the eulogy for Lionel Hampton, Mary Rockefeller, Lawrence Rockefeller, David Rockefeller, when you are a pastor of a church where everybody seemed like you were a celebrity or they made you one, you discovered that at their funerals, when you were asked to give the eulogy, you need to understand that if you really want to get a good compliment, remember that after people have sat for three and four hours listening to the wonderful comments about everybody who was anybody, the best way to have them pat you on the back is to say, Dr. Forbes, that was short and that was sweet. <clears throat> what David Dinkins discovered, the Honorable Mayor Dinkins, when he sat through all of those funerals at Riverside, was that I had a formula for how I did a eulogy. And he liked it. The formula seemed to have been, if possible, Jim Forbes is going to find something about the person that made God proud of that person as one of God's children. That's the first thing. And the second thing, Jim Forbes is going to try to find some truth that God wishes to share with us to help us in the journey that lies ahead. Now. In order to help you answer me later on, say, Jim, good word, man. It was short and it was sweet. What I've decided to do is to tell you something about what Mayor Dinkins did that I think made God proud that there's David, a man after my own heart. And secondly, I'm going to try to tell you a message that God wants David Dinkins' life to leave an impact in your mind 
regarding what we need to do during these perilous times. And if I can do that in a brief time with a couple of poems and sit down, you're going to pat me on the back and say, man, that was short and that was sweet. But let me give you the first answer. What was it about David Dinkins that made God say, now, there's my little guy. Let me tell you what I have looked through the years at his life. And finally, out of my package of little poetry here and there, I picked this out because I think this describes his spirituality. See, I was a Pentecostal by background. Riverside called me, made me an American Baptist in UCC. David Dinkins was a good Anglican. <laughs> but this is his spirituality. Pondering spirituality, I mean to include all there is of me, both public worship and private devotions, my values and habits, hopes and desires, what makes me strong and what inspires. I think of the powers I cannot see and how they help shape my destiny. I think of what brings me joy and peace, when burdened, bewildered, what gives me release. I think of my place in my family and the spirit that builds up community. And I wonder if earth is glad I'm here. Am I spreading love or stirring up fear? I try to discern if there's more for me right here where I am or beyond the sea. When I'm in the spirit, these words come through. You are so precious. I'm glad I made you. I think God might say this about David Dinkins. Man, you are so precious, classy, just excellent. I'm glad I made you, gave you to New York City as its 106th mayor. Now, let me tell you something else. David Dinkins was conscientious about what mattered to God. Black lives matter, yeah, that's fine. But what matters to God? Black lives matter, black leadership matters, but look at David's life and I think if you read the mayor's life, the book, you will discover while we wait and think about what we need to do in 22 or 24 for leadership of the nation or local organizations. Read the book, look at David Dinkins' life, and I think you may get a clue as to what matters to God with respect to leadership of our community. Now, I was invited to come to the city hall by the mayor, the new mayor, after the election. And when I arrived, it was my time to say something. And this is what I said. And David Dinkins never let me forget it. I said, Mayor, there's a virus out there. Many people are carrying it and spreading it. They don't even know they've got it, but it's out there and it could destroy our city. No, our civilization. From that day early on in his administration, every time I met David Dinkins anywhere, he would say, there's a virus out there. And he was determined that I keep my mind on what was activating, what was manifesting that. And I'll share that with you, and then I'll tell you the message I think God wants me to share with you regarding what this nation needs to do if we are to survive, to be a real democracy in these trying times. Let, 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 me, let, me, let me mention several of the things that are happening with respect to the virus. 
And I'm not talking now about COVID-19. I'm talking about one that was here way back, even when our Constitution was being affected, talking about all are created equal and endowed by our Creator about certain inalienable rights. But even then, slavery was condoned as all right for a great nation. Well, Mayor, I know he, you know he's listening, so you, you know Joyce is listening together with him. Listen, man, hey, that virus is out there, man. If you don't believe it, look at all of the efforts across the land with respect to voter suppression. Listen, God gives each of us the power to choose, to vote opinions and express our views, to show up and vote is our destiny. It's a sign of God-given humility, humanity. Don't tamper with my vote or mute my voice. It's a vile transgression to kill my choice. When you support my vote, when you suppress my vote, you curse my soul. For that you'll be sentenced without parole. Now there's one other thing I want to mention about the virus. Uh, I think you, you, you heard about it and I, I simply think I need to mention it because it's important for what I'm talking about today. Let me see if I can find it. Oh yeah, here it is. Talking about the virus. Do you all remember the night that the word came and David Dinkins would not allow me to name names, but you know who I'm talking about. When some vile words were said in the Oval Office, this is a divine reprimand for that. It comes from that virus. Don't ever call people that again. Whatever their flaws, they are precious to me. Though marred and scarred and incomplete, in my hands I'm shaping their destiny. Many and varied are the imperfections of all finite souls who walk the earth. My love is a lab for their refinement, tweaking each design even after birth. I am the potter and you are the clay. I honor your freedom to be what you may. I assure you, I will lure you constantly to be the kind of person you were meant to be. What you have called odious waste, excrement, trash, food for swine, and time will be seen for the treasure it is, a rare work of art by an artist divine. Narcissism sees itself divine, defacing in others the likeness of mine. Such blasphemous curses defiles each race. Nothing can cure it but transforming grace. And hear these words. There is no superior nation, tribe, or class. Self-assigned supremacy is a toxic mass. Walls block the truth of the human situation. See if you can catch it. All are sacred humanity in transformation. Now, I want to close so you can say it was short and sweet. Uh, Mayor Dinkins remembers and Joyce beside him those awful days after 9-11, we would walk down Fifth Avenue and the clouds were hanging heavy for many, many, many days. And we wondered, will we weather this storm? Will we get through this? Must we go to war? What must we do? Well, the word is before us today. My brothers and sisters, listen. My wife Betty is here. She used to get her hair done with Joyce in Hair Rules together. Je Thank you, Betty, for being here to honor Miss Joyce, your dear friend, your person in the hair salon. But let me tell you this. I want you to know that God gives us David Deacon's life to remind us that what was wrong with America that got us off track is we lost faith in the God who made us 
who was there with the founding fathers, we became a despiritualized nation. A despiritualized nation is a nation that loses its close connection to its source of being, of meaning, of purpose, of responsibility, of mission, of divine and human relationality. Y'all, that's what messed us up. That's why we are in the trouble we are in now. We have dared to drift away, to kick to the edge the reality of divine grace that made us. David Deacon's life is designed to remind us if America is ever to be great again, she must decide to let God be God again. We must remember that if black folks kick to the side and then white folks were made supreme, white supremacy has in a sense, usurped the place of God. So you can say he was short and sweet. Let me remind you, it is only, it is only when this nation reestablishes its connection with the God, our creator, and learn that we are all one family and begin to treat each other as one people under God, that God Almighty will say to us, now David, they are beginning to act like they know they are my children as well. I think I'm going to be proud of them again. That's it. In case you don't realize it, that was a preacher. That was a good preacher. And I have better sense than to try to preach or out-preach a great preacher. But he's also my preacher. And I'm going to take a sermon that he gave me and try to weave it into what he was saying about our friend, David Dinkins. We were talking one night, Dr. Forbes and I, I call him, you know, maybe two, three times a year. And he said, we have to decide whether we were sold or sent. Now, while he was talking, I rephrased that into the life that I have been sharing with David Dinkins, which started when I was 16. He was 21 and back from the Marines. He was as disciplined and organized as I was young and wild and crazy. And he used to grab me and say, come here, buddy. Come here, buddy. How you doing? Are you making your classes? I said, well, uh, 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 uh. and he sort of took me under his wing with his Marine Corps discipline and my wild child from New Orleans at Howard University. And um, he started the process of helping me find my way to God. 
Now, I don't know whether he thought of that that way, but that's what I've been hearing from everybody that has spoken to us today. That through David Dinkins, you were finding your way to the creator of heaven and earth. And it happened in strange and wonderful ways. But Dr. Forbes, David Dinkins is with us. I think one of the last times I was here was some 50 some years ago where I was here with Martin Luther King and he preached here just before we went to Memphis. And so this is a holy place for me. And I'm looking for great things to happen to you and to me. All of this cathedral is not in vain. All of the life of David and Joyce was for a purpose. And he understood that purpose, I think, even as a student at Howard University. He saw potential in everybody he met. And he found a way to help you bring forth that potential and put it into some structure that would enable you to make a contribution to humanity. Anybody that got in here has been doing something worthwhile most of their life, whether you know it or not. You are being used by the Spirit of God in this time to do what? I'm not yet sure. But if you heard Dr. Forbes, you heard a glimmer of what we all know in our private moments that this world needs. This world needs love. And David Dinkins loved all of us even when we were unlovable. In fact, he was attracted to the unlovableness about us and tried to bring us back with some discipline into the possibility of doing something creative somewhere, sometime with somebody. I think that's the way the Holy Spirit works in this world. And we are here because David and Joyce, whether we knew it or not, and I think all of us knew it, put us in their spiritual family. And uh, David Jr. is going to tell us more about that. I'm going to say one thing because I think David Dinkins worked on me in a strange way. But he didn't know he was doing it necessarily and he didn't intend the consequences. But that's the way the Lord works. He invited me to come up here to campaign for him back when he was running for borough president, I think. And in the meantime, Jimmy Carter got to be president and made me the ambassador to the United Nations. And he called and said, look, I know you promised to come, but now you, you at the UN, I can't ask you to walk the streets of Harlem with me. I said, why not? <laughs> That's what you're supposed to do. I said, the United Nations is a part of the political order. The borough president is a part of the political order. And that's what we were marching across the South to kind of integrate the political order into the international order and make it all a part of the divine order. All of us in the civil rights movement were preachers. And 
We didn't have pulpits most of the time, but we preached all of the time. And we preached with our presence. We preached with our attitudes. We preached when we could love the unlovable. And the amazing thing to me was, and it was one night in, uh, well, it was more than a night. It was one of the roughest parts of the civil rights movement. Uh, where a lot of us got beat up. And then the next couple of days, the same clan that beat up all these black people decided it was gonna march through the black community. Well, marching through Lincolnville and St. Augustine is like marching down 125th Street in Harlem. Except when they marched down through Lincolnville, the black folk that had been beat up by this clan started singing. They started singing, I love everybody. I love everybody in my heart. You can't make me doubt him because I know too much about him. That's why I love everybody in my heart. Well, that was a Saturday and I think the Monday next was when the Congress kind of quit filibustering and passed the 1964 Civil Rights Act. And nobody would see the connection between those events except those who were in them. And I'm trying to say to you that just as I have seen the Lord working with me through many dangers, toils, and snares, the sufferings that you have shared and the sufferings that you have borne, the smile, the compassion, the sensitivity and the humor of David and Joyce Dinkins translated into your lives and my life. I ended up coming up here and campaigning with him uh, for borough, borough president. And then I went to the United Nations and every now and then some preacher would call and I'd end up going there or somebody from some university would call and I figured that uh, that's the reason I got here so I'd speak to them and this is personal, but I needed to say it here in New York because uh, Harry Belafonte invited me to his home one night and Shimon Paris was there. And he talked with me for almost four hours about how Israel and the Palestinians were going to somehow become reconciled. And then two weeks later, I had lunch with Moshe Dayan and he said the same thing. And um, wanted to get me involved in the Middle East. Well, I kept telling them all, I could not do that in New York. If I was in Atlanta, the black and Jewish community in Atlanta get along very well. John Lewis was the chairman of the Black Jewish Coalition for the 30 years of his life, and that's the reason nobody could beat him in politics, because he had it locked up, the entire city. And so we're used to working together, but that wasn't happening here at that time. And so the Palestinians called, and they wanted to bring their report before the United Nations in the month that I was going to be the chairman. And I said, please don't do that. I, I, I don't want to get in this. I, I, leave me to Africa. <laughs> leave me to the Caribbean. Leave me to Europe. I get along well. To ten David and I played tennis with the Russian ambassador regularly. 
Uh, and so we, we were getting along with everybody in the world. We had the Chinese come up to the Waldorf and my mother-in-law came up from Alabama with a, a load of uh, slow smoked ribs and, and chicken and corn off the cob that grew in her garden and greens and peas. And, and we had a, we had a wang dang doodle in the Waldorf Astoria with the first delegation of Chinese that came here. And we ended up sitting on the floor drinking men juleps, and I never had a Chinese veto the whole while I was here. <laughs> and there's something about us people that the Lord has put here for something special. And so when all hell broke loose, before anybody could tell me, I said, I got to go. I said, because all of the people that I've been preaching to in Harlem and Brooklyn, I said, if they start picketing me at the UN, they gonna come down to protect me. Please let me get out of here. And so I left here that very night and took my letter of resignation, didn't give it to President Carter because he wouldn't have taken it. But I gave it to the Secretary of State because it was not my time to be any more in national government. But that was the best thing that happened to me because when I got back home, a nice little old lady came into a meeting where we were discussing who was gonna be the mayor of Atlanta. And she took her walking stick and shook it in my face and she said, look here boy, when you came here, you wasn't nothing. And we done made you somebody. We done sent you to Congress and United Nations and you've been all over the world. We need you to come back here and be mayor. And I say, yes, ma'am. <laughs> and that is the convoluted way that the Lord works with us. But Dinkins and Sutton, Wrangell, Patterson, all, you know, offered to help me here in New York. But um, we went back to Atlanta and we ended up in a pouring down rain, having a 74% black turnout. And that's the only reason I got elected. Now I say that to say that that's the reason I was campaigning with David Dinkins here in New York. Because all of this preaching and praying and moaning and groaning we do has to be translated into deeds of love and kindness through which the heavenly kingdom comes. Yes, the heavenly kingdom about which we pray in this church since 1857 or something like that, they said. That kingdom comes on earth through politics. And David and Joyce may have understood that or they may not have but they were used by God to keep alive the hope of the kingdom of God descending amongst us. You are the remnants of that kingdom. You were sent here for a purpose. Yes, your ancestors might have been sold, but Joseph in his coat of many colors was sold into slavery by his brothers. But uh, when he got close to Pharaoh and straightened out, helped Egypt understand how to deal with famine, when his brothers finally came, he felt no animosity toward them. He welcomed them and did not blame them because he saw that 
they had put him in the place where God could use them to build his kingdom. That was the mission of David and Joyce Dinkins. And we are left to carry out that mission and help it to become flesh in this difficult, complicated time in our lives. God bless you, but God has sent you. And he gives you the power and you will one day share the glory. And you understand it better by and by. How'd that go, Katrina? Everything's been said, but everybody hasn't said it? Something like that? My father certainly believed in that. Uh, I was uh, sitting over there, and Donna started. She said, I'll go first. When we were planning this. And, uh, you go last. Okay, you go after Forbes and Wrangell <laughs> and Young. Yeah, you, 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 you go the last, you back clean up. I say, okay, that's what I do. I back clean up. Okay, good. <laughs> so I'm sitting over there with Paula, and I said, sweetheart, hand me a pen. And so Donna, I said, okay, she, okay, Katrina, okay. <sighs> Andy, 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 yeah. Reverend, uh, not so much. Charlie, absolutely. <laughs> Mary, you touched me up a little bit too. Okay. But um, I'm going to channel my father in that same idea that Katrina discussed. Everything's been said, but everybody hasn't said it. I'm going to channel him now because I remember we were at a function, and Charlie, you were guilty of this again. Uh, Charlie told the ditch digger story. And no, I'm, I'm not going to tell the ditch digger story. That, that story is <laughs> retired with father, OK? So, so Charlie tells the ditch digger story. So uh, I'm sitting next to Dad, <laughs> and I go, man, he took your stuff. <laughs> I didn't say stuff, but uh, you get the idea. I said, Dad, he, he took your stuff. And I said, you're, uh, now I used another word, uh, you're in trouble. Okay. <laughs> and, and he gave me this kind of thousand yard stare. I said, you're, <laughs> you're in it now, right? And he goes, yeah, he told it, but he doesn't tell it as good as I do. <laughs> so undeterred, he got up there, he told the story. Yeah, and okay, no, if uh, I married him, he'd be mayor, ha, 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 and everybody laughed, and he brought the house down again. So. In that spirit, Father, I'm, uh, I'm going to take my attempt to make you and Mom proud. Uh, many months ago, there have been so many challenges uh, in maintaining normal life. Uh, last year, the funerals of Mom and Dad were about a month apart. We only had the immediate family in attendance. They're together next door over here in the columbarium. Uh, we're here tonight because mom wanted to have a ceremony at this cathedral. We were unable to do that properly 
last year, so we've endeavored to do this today. Circumstances are still very challenging, obviously. We didn't think back then when we planned this for October 23rd, we'd still be discussing COVID and vaccines and social distancing. But we felt obligated to fulfill mom's wish, give dad the send off that he used to discuss all the time, and give our family and dear friends, all of you, a chance to say goodbye. Uh, Mom and Dad were experiencing their own difficulties uh, as they reached their late 80s and early 90s. Mom struggled with dementia, and Dad battled for many years with his heart disease. But they rarely complained, even in the final stages, because they could look back on a life filled with joy and family and friendship. The best moments of those final years were the family gatherings, holidays, birthdays. Those are, those are gone now. It's going to leave a huge void. I won't lie to you about that. I'll miss all that terribly. But there were other times of joy that maybe we can still continue with the, the rest of the family and move on to another chapter. Francois and Khalila are expecting a newborn next month. Congratulations. So another generation is on the way. But uh, aside from those family gatherings, uh, a great source of joy for mom and dad were the visits from Khalila, Francois, Jamal. You guys brought a very special energy to the apartment. Uh, it, it was a vibrancy that really lifted their spirits. And my goddaughter, who's here somewhere, um, she'd come over with her own special brand of electricity. And uh, what's, what's particularly special about her is her grandmother and mom were friends way back when, when her father and I were attending elementary school and then high school together. But bless you all for that. Uh, I think they were maybe tired of Donna and myself, so that extra boost of energy that you guys would bring was, was precious. Uh, we, uh, we owe a debt of gratitude to the doctors and the caregivers who made my folks comfortable and gave them a good quality of life as best the circumstances would allow. And Paula, sweetheart, you've been a, a tower of strength uh, through this whole circumstance, the, the pandemic, mom and dad passing. And at that time, your mom passed away in a nursing home. You didn't get to say goodbye to her. So I hope today we can share a goodbye for her as well and give you some closure there. Donna, um, those final years that I referenced with mom and dad, they were difficult for you as well, even being up in Connecticut. Uh, Donna's a clinical social worker. She spends all day dealing with other people's problems and helping them navigate their circumstance. She does that, and then she would help manage mom and dad's health care with their doctors and the caregivers, uh, call her brother uh, all too frequently. But uh, she would. She, she just had an infinite amount of time for them. And there was, there was never a time that she wasn't ready and, and able to help. Donna was the one that called me uh, to let me know that uh, mom had gone and that dad was, dad was close. And I got to the apartment, mom had already passed. Dad was, uh, on his way. But Donna stayed in touch, and she always knew the status of them, even if I was traveling wherever I was going throughout the country and around the world. She kept in touch and 
Sister Dear, you, uh, I, I couldn't have done this without you. And uh, even now planning this memorial, she's tirelessly been working on the program, the music with her husband Jay, the speakers, coordinating with St. John's here. Uh, I don't know when you sleep, but uh, that's why we always refer to her as the golden child. Thank you so much, Donna. I, thanks is an even And we do have some family in attendance. Uh, dad's side of the family, uh, Aunt Joyce, uh, who is still with us, Dad's baby sister, her, her children are here, Shahida, Candy, Bobby, Stacy, and what is virtually the Dinkins family, the hailing prices are represented as well. So thank you for coming. Uh, those family functions I referred to, you all were always at them because it wasn't a family function unless you all were there. Well, we're here today, as previously mentioned by other speakers, uh, to celebrate mom and dad's life, not just to mourn them, because it was a life well lived and, and accomplished. But this is extremely personal for me, as you can imagine. I was very close to both of them. And when I was weak, they helped me to be strong. If I was ignorant, they gave me knowledge. And when I was foolish, they made me wise. And they always did it with love, strength, knowledge, wisdom, but it was enveloped in love. And they also possessed nearly limitless patience uh, that was typically put to the test on those car rides down to New Jersey to visit the relatives. Donna would be misbehaving in the back and dad would threaten to pull over to the side of the road and eventually he did. But uh, Donna, I wish you hadn't gotten me in trouble all those times. I could really get myself in trouble enough on my own accord. And that was special about them too for me. Uh, I might not have always been so lovable, but they always gave me love. I, if, if I was lazy, misbehaved, or whatever failing I had, incredibly, they seemed to love me even more. And they never gave up on me, never gave up on me. And they always found ways to inspire me. And one of the great lessons I learned from them is friendship. All of you here today are, are about that. The outpouring of affection and sympathies uh, from all of you at times have been overwhelming. Uh, and the support that was given to us to help reconcile their lives to a very difficult situation, the way uh, COVID has affected all of us, I, I greatly appreciate that support as well that we got. And most importantly, the fact that you all have kept my parents in your hearts and your minds. Thank you for that. They'll never go away as long as you do that. Bless you all for that. Well, they were trailblazers that became uh, historic figures. The foundational core of mom and dad were a husband and wife that were committed to raising a family. They had no idea that they were going to uh, rise to the level that they did of, of recognition and, and become symbols for so many. When they first met on the campus of Howard University over 70 years ago, and how did it go there, Ambassador, that famous pickup line, hey, freshman, something like that, yeah. Uh, they had no idea that, that they would rise to the level that they have and, and become the, the significant figures in history. And there were, as, as parents, they, they, 
it, it was difficult for them growing up because they, they were trying to, to, to make their way and they had these two little kids, but they were never not available to us. I remember calling dad at his law practice when, when he was a, a fledgling lawyer at Diet Alexander and Dinkins. I remember calling him uh, at his office at City Hall. He always had time for us. And they also always worried about us too, as Donna mentioned her, her time in the Peace Corps. I don't think mom slept the three years you were away, Donna. And uh, even as we became adults, now social security age, they would still worry about us, what we were up to and what we were doing. And Donna, you look fabulous for you know, a grandmother to be, by the way, you know. <laughs> Congratulations, Granny. <laughs> well, um, mom and dad's place in history is secure. Um, time, as the mayor mentioned, has a way of uh, clarifying the truth about dad's time in office and mother as well. There was a very unfortunate phrasing in an obituary in the New York Times that suggested that dad was dwarfed by uh, those that preceded him and followed him. Uh, no, no insult intended here. Uh, and subsequent to that, that noise was drowned out by the truth and those that really understood what he meant to the city and the person that he was. And I, that's gratifying to me. It, 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 honestly, it, I don't think it would have mattered as much to dad as it would to the rest of us because he stood by his principles and he did what he thought was right. He didn't need validation that way because he knew in his heart that was the right thing to do. And when he took what were at times unpopular stands that later became popular, he knew that his own moral compass was the right thing to follow. I, uh, I have a couple of stories that really only I know that I wanted to share, also because that's material that none of the rest of you could, could take from me before. Uh, Mom uh, was uh, so sweet, but she, uh, she was not big on uh, public displays of affection. It kind of made her a little uncomfortable. But being the mama's boy that I am, uh, I just couldn't help myself. And we were out at dinner one night, a uh, little restaurant on the Upper East Side, and I was holding her hand. Her hands are so soft, they were just like velvet. And uh, caressing her cheek, a woman was staring at us from another table. And uh, mom goes, see, see, this, this isn't right, David. You know, see, see, you know, it's a little too much in public. I said, a woman's staring. I said, yes, mom, she is. And I said, you know why? And she says, no. I said, well, probably her son doesn't love her as much as I love you. <laughs> and she thought for a second, she goes, yes, son, that's, that's right. And then, she, and then she said, may I have my hand back now? I'd like to finish my dinner. <laughs> so. And um, so many stories about dad you've probably heard over the years from me and others, but this one is a, uh, a special private moment and a, and a moment of pride in a very odd way. Uh, election night, uh, the night of the re-election, and exit polling was going back and forth. They weren't sure who was going to win the contest, and eventually it was decided that Giuliani had won. Uh, there were some that suggested, Dad told me that maybe a recount, uh, to contest the election. And he was relating that to me back in his room as he was preparing to go down to make the concession speech. 
I was helping with his tie, and luckily it wasn't a bow tie, so I was uh, able to do it. And he said, I'm not going to do that, son. It's, it's not good for the city. I have to put the city first. This would be a disruption. This would be a, a circumstance that would just create more chaos. I'm not going to do that. He was ready to sacrifice himself and his own political ambition for the sake of the city. As odd as it sounds, I couldn't have been more proud of him at that moment for what he did because he put the city first before himself and his own ambitions. And then when it came time to leave the room, and some of you were there, the suite that they were at was at the end of this hallway. You all lined the hallway from the room all the way down to the elevator and gave my folks uh, a standing ovation as they walked down the corridor. It was a corridor of applause, like nothing I could have ever imagined. And the dignity for the which he comported himself was a terrific example for me. And I wish all the New Yorkers, people around the world, could have seen what made this man so special. They were separately wonderful and a perfect complement to each other. She was my staunchest defender and could be as tough as she was gentle. He was a role model, a mentor, and a friend. Now and forever, that bond's going to be unbreakable. Thank you.
for a lifetime of service. I think you deserve a theme song. So, tonight, this Ashford and Simpson song belongs to David Dinkins. Reach out and touch. And his lovely wife, somebody's hand. Make this world a better place. Somebody's hand, 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 make this world a better place, make this world a better place, if you Reach! 
to Donna, to David, to Jamal, to Kalila, to my big brother, Jay Hogard, and to my bride, um, Deborah Jeffries Hogard, two scriptures uh, that encompass what my relation to Dave and to Joyce Dinkins, who I share uh, my birthday with. Um, Revelation 21, two through eight, and Matthew 25 through 34. Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with us, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. Then he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And he said to me, it is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and end. I will give of the fountain of the water of life freely to him who thirsts. He who overcomes shall inherit all things and I will be with him, God, and he shall be my son and daughter. Then the king will say to those on his right hand, come you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the founding of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry? and feed you, or thirsty, and give you drink? When did we see you a stranger and take you in, or naked and clothe you? Or when did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? And the king will answer and say to them, Assuredly, I say to you, and as much as you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. Amen.
That uh, concludes the memorial, but I'd like to express my gratitude uh, first to the speakers. Thank you very much. You're so dear to our family and have special connection to mom and dad, and your words uh, touched me, and I'm sure everyone else here deeply. Thank you. The Cathedral St. John's, uh, Donna, myself, the family, for you to help us put this memorial on under these circumstances, it took a lot of uh, dedication, willingness to do whatever it took to get this job done. And for that, again, thank you very much. Uh, Kenan, Patrick Malloy, Patrick, you've, you've been with us since we had the ceremony for mom and dad over in the columbarium. You gave us support and guidance, and uh, bless you. Is that appropriate? Bless you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, Lisa, Lisa Schubert, um, you organizing this and getting uh, all the logistics and your staff and assured us this would be able to be accomplished. Yes, you were right. Thank you. Thank you. Christian Mardonis, uh, your technical expertise and event planning were instrumental in this coming off. Christian, thank you. Thank you. All of you at St. John's, thank you. Thank you very much. The uber-talented brother-in-law, Jay Hogard. Jay, thank you very much. Like, you know, you, Francois, and Paula, we annex well into the family. You know, we always add on the good part. Uh, Valerie Simpson, thank you, Valerie. I don't know where <laughs> the video montage, uh, that was done through a lot of hours of culling through family archives, photos, uh, time taken by Donna, myself, family members, but it was assembled by my friend and colleague, Jesse Cook. Jesse, thank you very much. Thank you. And Linda Hamilton. Many of you know Linda. <laughs> colleague to dad family friend, family member. Linda, thank you so much. Thank you, Linda. I don't know if you had a chance prior to the memorial, but if you did want to pay your respects, mom and dad are in the columbarium back in that direction. This is where mom wanted their final resting place to be on earth. And, uh, it's a lovely chamber back there. Uh, you see them as soon as you walk in, Joyce and David Dinkins. Um, if you care to pay your respects, uh, they'll be there. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all so much. Get home safe. Love all of you. Love you.